Hi, Paul Donovan here from avtechnician.ca, your channel for AV technicians, tips and tricks for AV technicians. Today we're going to talk about miking the choir or acoustical instruments such as drums. Now here's the challenge. You've got a choir, say 50 voices, that you want to mic them up because they're going to be performing somewhere. If you're lucky, you're in a performance hall such as a large theater that is acoustically better suited where to have a choir sing with almost no microphones. But sometimes you're not so lucky, you may be in a gymnasium, or you might be in a banquet hall or a ballroom, where the sounds are not as, as well for dealing with the sounds of a choir. So you do need to mic the phone, microphone these up. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the different kinds of microphones and some of the techniques that you need to think about when you're miking a choir. So here you are, one of the types of microphones that you will see, this is, which is the hanging microphone. This is a specially designed microphone that is used primarily to bike choirs. You'll notice that it's very small. In fact, the cable running to it is very thin and it's attached on the end with a standard XLR jack. These are usually uh, condenser mics that require phantom power from your mixer and sometimes the control, the, the actual power is powered up in the mic head itself or actually in the XLR jack that is attached to it. Choir mics are condenser mics that use the cardioid or the supercardioid polar pattern. What this means is this is a microphone that tends to gather the sound from a larger window in fact, some of them are technically set up in what's called a 100 degree window. That means they've got a window of capture that sort of is a little bit, I can't get my hands that way, but 100 degrees, a little bit more than the 90 degree parallel, but a little bit wider. They capture sound right out that way. And this makes a very effective microphone because the quality of sound that it captures right out to the edges is usually pretty equal. The hanging choir mic is often used in more permanent installations, such as in churches and performance halls, places where the choir might always be standing or sitting in performances. Not so much used in halls where you're moving choirs around and things are changing a lot, but as I said, it's primarily used in places like churches. You'll notice if you look at this picture of the choir mic, there's a little metal piece wrapped around it. This metal piece is what helps keep the microphone angled up and it also helps control the twisting and swaying in the wind, assuming there is any wind, in the facility where you're at. These microphones are quite subject to a, a swing, and sometimes people will actually also not only have it hanging down, but they'll attach a very thin filament up to the wall to keep them from swaying back and forth too much. Also, as the wire gets older, it tends to s sag a little more, and sometimes these will twist. All you got to do is go back on that metal and just twist the microphone back into place. It is a little tricky, but that's why we use them in a more permanent installation where choirs tend to always be in the same space. Another type of microphone you might use is the type in this picture, the type that sits on a stand. In this case, this is a, the same microphone as the, as the hanging microphone, but it is attached on a very long flexible boom attached to a stand. This is more portable and movable as you are putting together a choir that may be temporary for a performance or even choirs that tend to have a variation in the numbers of people, locations of people, and things like that. Um, this is not usually used with a regular standard dynamic microphone. This is still used in the same cardio and super cardio type microphone that still has the wide capture zone. Um, these can still be, uh, like I said, these are just the same as the hanging microphone, but it is attached to a stand. Now anything that's, that's attached to a stand, you do have to watch out for residual noises, such as the noise of <coughs> as people are walking, this could be translated through the thing. But generally when the microphone is active, people are standing still in the choir while they're doing their performances. The placement of a microphone is also pretty critical when working with these types of microphones. Remember they have that 100 degree capture zone and just about the entire swoop is able of capturing sound. And that is why when you're trying to place these microphones, you want to place them at what we call an equal distance. 
Now, it's not exactly equal distance, but it's a somewhat equal distance to the various levels. Many choirs are often grouped up into various levels from uh, two or three layers or rows of people. So you want to have the bottom end of the thing, like it shows in the photo here, the bottom end of, the, of that 100 degrees, you want to have the bottom end of it where it's going to capture the voice of the front row pe person, and the top of it, hopefully, will be also able to capture the voice of the person in the top row as well. So it's important that we look at the distance and try to measure and be sure that the voices do capture and get captured equally. Now, sometimes you're going to have smaller choirs, like they say a chorale or something, maybe 10, 15 people who are singing. And this time, you want to think about how many microphones am I going to need for that. When you have the bigger group, you often set things up where, you know, as many as 20 people, you will have one microphone set up for as many as 20 people, equally spaced out for the thing. But now you're down in the 12 to 15 zone. You know, what do you do now? Do you still space them out? Well, a lot of technicians will say you just place two microphones on the stance. If you're using these, these proper choir mics, these cardioid or super cardioid uh, microphones, and you just space them out so that they're more or less equal. Now, each microphone does pick up a little bit from the crossover of the voices. But if you're careful with that spacing, you will find you won't have any um, pattern or looping that will happen that sometimes happens with phase variance is the word I'm looking for. You won't have any phase variance where the sound of the two microphones is processing the same sound twice. So you also want to think about that. Now, when your group gets even smaller, when your chorale group is, say, down to a quartet or a quintet or a sextet, maybe that time is when you want to consider giving each person their own individual microphone. Now, I'm talking about choral work where the people will put a microphone on the stand because they don't want to be holding a microphone. A lot of people don't know how to hold a microphone properly but you put it on a stand, well, if you've got a smaller group of people, you'll have a stand for each person. And then you make sure that the stand is placed at a distance that works to capture the voice of the person who is standing at that microphone. But you know that every microphone still catches a little bit off the side. Now, in that case, you'll probably use a standard dynamic microphone that has a narrower cone of collections. And so you won't have as much spillover as you would if you had the wider zone uh, cardio style. But what making a small group individually does help a lot in your production. And if you are recording, you have the option to record each microphone on a separate channel if your software permits. So you have everything from the big 50 voice choir all the way down to the little quartet and trio. And you have miking plans. Always bear in mind that there's a big difference between the big two, gru two groups. And you also want to bear in mind that the unique cardioid shape, cardioid shape of these choir microphones captures the sound much broader and much more equal. Much more equal, yes. And when you're working with a smaller group, you can use dynamic microphones. And of course, then you get the performing type of quartets where everybody who knows how to do it, they hold the microphone themselves. So you get a lot of, say, the gospel quartets and stuff like that. People who know how to hold the microphone the correct way, well, then they hand hold the microphone as they move about. So the other thing that happens is, of course, is a lot of times you see uh, bands, I'm talking rock and roll bands and so on, who have monitors facing them. When you have a large choir, it is hoped that you don't have to have a stage monitor to, to help the choir hear what's happening. Now, if there's an orchestra or an acoustical sound uh, for the music, oftentimes you don't need to have a monitor for the choir because the, the acoustic sound of the orchestra or the, of the, or the chorale makes it possible for you to hear the music that is needed to sing properly. But what happens if the music is coming from a backing track and the choir needs to hear that backing track? Well, in that case, you need to have a speaker that is actually pointing at them. And one of the dangers with that is that speaker, the sound is going to bounce off the bodies and bounce back into the microphones. And oftentimes it will create a feedback on the microphones that is hard to get rid of and really bad if you're trying to record what's going on. So where possible, try to avoid blasting the sound from the monitor out to the choir. Let them have just enough volume so they can hear what they need to hear so that they can sing as needed. But other than that, please try to keep the stage monitors off or 
minimalized so that you don't have a lot of feedback issue. Now, the next question comes up is, uh, is there a difference of making a choir when you're in a live performance versus if you're in a studio doing a studio record? The simple answer is yes. You can still use the same type of microphones, but in a studio, you usually have control of extraneous noises. Therefore, the room noises are diminished. There's no audience ch uh, laughing, chuckling, talking, coughing, all that stuff. So in a studio, you have more control. In fact, I have seen a choir up to 40 people microphone off of one hanging microphone placed about 15 to 20 feet away from the choir in a studio. And this is possible because in the studio, you have control of the extraneous noises. The choir master will also be trying to get everybody to blend together so that you don't have a lot of mixture so that the total sound coming from the choir is balanced out as they listen to each other. Now, one of the dangers of having a microphone so far away is it's also going to start to pick up noises that reverberate in the room. This can be fans, air conditioning, cooling systems, mechanical devices. As I said, in a good studio, those things are controlled, and so you don't get them blowing on you, you don't make any noises, and it helps. If that's the case, then you need to move the microphone closer. If you move it too close, you pr might need a couple of microphones to be sure you catch the audience. As I said, we're going to be talking all about choirs, but we also want to talk about miking drum kits. Drinking a drum kit is often a challenge because drums make a lot of noise. And it's very hard to specifically isolate the sounds of a specific drum without the other drums coming also into the microphone. In fact, I believe it's virtually impossible, at least acoustically. So one of the things you want to look at is a drum kit. A typical drum kit microphone kit has five or more microphones that are designed to work in specific types of instruments. You have the larger microphone, which is often used on the kick drum. You have a little more pinpoint uh, microphone that is usually, usually used on things like the tom-toms uh, or possibly the snare drum. Some technicians will put microphones on the top and the bottom of the snare drum. Some will put microphones hanging over top of the kit uh, facing off of the cymbals. A lot depends upon the nature of what they're trying to record and how much precision of the sounds of the individual instruments is required. The form of mounting these microphones, primarily we mount the microphones on some form of a stand. Often the stand is very similar to a microphone stand. Sometimes they're short stands and sometimes they're tall with booms. But oftentimes the tom-tom drums are actually mounted right on the drum itself. The type of microphone that's used is it's, it tends to catch the sound of the hitting of the drum head, but it doesn't take notice of the noise of the to be translated through the connector itself. I'm not sure exactly why, but tom-toms tend to be done that way. That's not saying you can't do it the other way. Now, since drums do make so much noise, there is one sure way to control each individual drum separately. That's if you can get the drummer to play on a digital drum kit. Yes, a digital drum kit, every single drum has its own connection and you can control the volumes of each one uh, and you can capture and adjust every sound. You can even change the sound from one style of drum to another. The often difficult part to this is a lot of drummers, especially the big rock and roll ones, they don't like digital drums. It doesn't give them the right feel, it doesn't give them the right texture, and of course there's the whole dramatic thing of the banging of the cymbals, it's just not there. So when you use a digital drum kit, um, oftentimes your drummer might not be very happy using it. Now I happen to come from a church background and I've attended a lot of churches where I've noticed the churches are wrapped in plastic. Well, not exactly wrapped in plastic, but they're they're surrounded by a plexiglass wall. And this is done because a lot of churches, even though some churches are large, a lot of churches are smaller, or even small venues, the drum can overwhelm the sound way beyond what you want to hear. And as such, they put these plexiglass walls to try to contain the noise so that it doesn't blast out into the room and blast through all the other performers and overwhelm the sound on every microphone in the room. So you often see these plexiglass things like you see in the picture here or this other picture here where these plexiglass uh, acoustical panels 
help control the volume of sound. Now, some of these church groups will also put pillows inside the kick drum or the bass drum. This is sort of funny. I'm thinking, well, what, are they got a pillow there just in case they need a nap? Well, no, it's also because the kick drum is quite loud, and the pillow will absorb an awful lot of the kick noise. This is handy, too, when you're putting a, a, kick, stand, a kick drum microphone. You try to put it inside the, the box of the big kick drum, and so the, 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 blank, uh, the pillows are s absorbing sound, but your microphone in there is still catching the sound of the, of the hammer hitting the face of the kick drum. So here I've got a picture of a typical, well, not so typical. This is actually more microphones than I would ever use. But this is a, this is a set of microphone drum, uh, microphones for drum kits. And this, is, this person who's put this together has really loaded it up with a lot of drums, a lot of microphones. I would probably not do that. I would probably put uh, uh, one microphone on the kick drum as close to the head as possible inside the circle. I'd have two high top, uh, high top tom toms and the tom tom on the bottom, each with their own mounted mic. I'd put another microphone on the snare drum. And that's pretty much where I would stop. Uh, I'd let the cymbals survive on their own just by the noise of the room. And then, of course, if you've got a drummer who is also a performer, a singer, then you need to put a microphone over top on a big boom hanging down in front of their mouth because they, those ones are, those are unique people, those that can sing and drum at the same time. I can't figure that out. Both hands busy, both feet are busy, and they're singing? Boy, those are talented people. So there you have it. Paul Donovan here from AV Technician. I talked today about how to microphone a choir and also how to microphone drums. Very challenging opportunities in the AV Technician world, but normally in the AV Technicians, we don't often do that very often because that's more in the concert and, and performance of the bands and so on. And we're, we're usually doing conferences and events, and we don't often have to microphone uh, drums. But we do occasionally have to microphone a choir and so on. And oftentimes we don't have the beautiful microphones that are needed for a choir. So there we have it. Paul Donovan here from avtechnician.ca. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel, check out our website at www.avtechnician.ca for more tips and tricks on how to be a good AV technician. Have a great day and thank you for watching.